Hey guys, Corey Allen here with the Overton Report. Of course, uh, I know it's a little late, and I know that uh, tomorrow and this weekend is going to be quite a mess with the with the South Carolina uh, Republican Party reorg and the election of uh, by delegates of the new state chair. We have. Uh, Drew McKissick, who's the incumbent. We have Jeff Davis, who is a part of my SCGOP, which uh, stay tuned at the OvertonReport.substack.com because we have something coming out uh, about their treatment of the little guy. And I think it's going to really blow your mind the way that they uh, treat people while claiming to be a champion of the proletariat. Sounds quite communist to me. Anyway, Sorry, got a little sidetrack. Uh, and then we have Zoe Warren. These are the top three frontrunners. Jeff Davis, Drew McKissick, and Zoe Warren. Well, earlier tonight, Zoe decided to do a town hall and uh, on Zoom. And there were dozens upon dozens of people who joined the call. If you didn't, well, that's okay because... 15 minutes into it, I asked the group if it would be okay for me to record uh, in, in order to bring what was being said, uh, Zoe's idea of where the party needs to go, uh, and the questions that people had for Zoe uh, on the future of the South Carolina Republican Party. And I think that it's very important for you, whether you're a delegate who will be at the state convention tomorrow, uh, Saturday, or whether you're just the average voter like me. Uh, I think that it's important for you to know what the candidates intend to bring to the party. So I wanted to give this a little introduction because like I said, it was about 15 minutes in to the meeting before I asked if it was okay for me to record. I got the go ahead and therefore, here you are. I really hope that you enjoy this. I think it'll be enlightening, if nothing else, for you. Ask you about this. And um, I got two questions, and it has to do with the same topic. It's about, and this is behalf of the new people like me, who we are trying desperately out there to get engaged. And then once we get them engaged, um, my th and, and for me personally, I've only voted in one out of the last three primaries. So because of last summer, what happened, that cut me off the delegate list. And it's it's very disappointing because I've worked really hard to be engaged and get others engaged. And I have so many friends that are going to the convention tomorrow and I couldn't. And um, so as chair, will you consider calling an EC meeting, a state EC meeting? I think that's how it works. Again, I'm not sure. And taking that rule away so that it doesn't harm newcomers like me. Um, and also, will you consider in the same breath to make it mandatory or whatever to, however you say it, to make each county chair um, be um, made to give their delegate list with contact information to all um, people that are running for that position so that everybody has the equal playing field. All, all Because if you're a delegate, you are going in there to vote on behalf of your people. And if yeah. you don't have the knowledge to make an informed decision, that is not fair for we the people. And if we're fighting for we the people in free and fair elections, Mm -hmm. Shouldn't those delegates have access to all candidates? And Absolutely. if they don't want their numbers passed out, it's it, we have two years till next reorg. We go ahead and implement it now. We can say, you know, look, if you're going to sign up to be a delegate, this is the new rule. You have to have your email out there or some sort, some form of contact for because you're voting on behalf of the people for the people to contact you yeah. mm -hmm. or any candidates, yeah. you know, let me, let me, let me answer that question for you too. Okay. I think Thank I, you. And that, you, that was it. 
Yeah, like I number one, the two of three rule I believe is unconstitutional. I fully believe that we're acting as an agency of the government when we do elections because it's governed by election law. And so um, because it's governed by election law, conventions have to be done a certain way. We have to elect certain things. And if we don't, we can be decertified, right, as a party. Because we are doing this work, even in our primaries, which is also inter-party, that punishing somebody for an act that was not punishable when they did it is ex post facto. You created a penalty for something that was not punishable when they did it back in the past. And if it would have been punishable back then, they would have changed their behavior. They would have done something different. If they knew they were going to be disqualified back then, if they didn't do X, then they probably would have done Y or X, or whatever it was, <laughs> so that they wouldn't be disqualified. Now, as far as calling the East executive committee together, like I, I don't know that that solves the puzzle. I think it has to be uh, undone at convention, but you, it could be right. There could be a rule in Robert's rules where we can do two thirds and suspend it. I know that, that that's possible in some county party uh, of politics. And so we'll make sure to look into that. Um, I need a parliamentarian to give me the exact way, the, the address. If you give me the address, the chapter verse, uh, I'll do it. <laughs> uh, but I, I'm of the opinion that write your appeals. I sent out an affidavit to people uh, that had information so you can write on an appeal because it ha you have to appeal no matter what. If you're going to go to court even, you have to use the agency's process. So appeal to the executive committee. Make sure you send the complaint to the Supreme Court. And then um, we'll go from there. Hopefully we can get it reversed in South Carolina and, and prove that it was just a, a kind of a heavy handed approach to try to do something that had merit. It's good to not want Democrats to vote in our elections and choose our officers. That's good. But it's not good to create a, a law that's kind of that is ex post facto, you know. So anyway, um, I hope that does that answer your question, Tracy? Yes, it does. Okay. And, I'm going to try um, to keep my answers quick, too, because I, I can talk long and. And, <laughs> and then will you um, also address the delegate list available to candidates and yeah. to also the their people in their county? So let's say I'm in Richland and I hear you and I want to call my delegates. I don't know. You know, I just. Mm -hmm. yeah. So anyway, any paid member who's paid their dues, especially if they're elected as an officer, if you're elected as an officer, as a delegate, that's an officer of the party. It really is you're going to vote for officers of the party, um, then you should be like any other elected official. When somebody's elected, their phone never gets given to the public. I mean, that's just a matter of course. Uh -uh. You know, so if people are running, there should be no, I'm not saying we should just give it out to everybody in the mama. But if you're running for an office, you should have access to that information. They just stopped doing it recently. I think it's a pretext to prevent people from having access so they can't reach the state with as much, you know, uh, reach as the state party can. Uh, however, the pretext was that somebody had uh, was making phone calls off that list for the Tea Party or something. And I, I think it's a pretext. I don't think it's real. I don't think it matters. Um, because up to that point, if you're running for office, you got the information. So um, I, I, I think you're right. I don't even know that the county parties necessarily um, need to be compelled to do it uh, as much as it should. They should be doing it. It should be like in our rules that if a, somebody's running for office and they're a Pay, their dues are paid up. They're a duly paid member of the, of the party. They should, if they're running, they should have access so they can contact the people. So uh, let me ask you a question as a follow-up to that. Um, when it comes to running for state chair, the actual official nomination and then second, that happens on the floor the, the day of. Is that correct? Yes, sir. That's correct. Uh, okay. So with that being the case, um, it seems like it might be a little more complicated than just saying anybody who's running should get the list, right? Because if that, if that's the litmus test, then anybody could say they're running and then be given full access. Like for example, the, uh, the, the person with the fake name of Joe, who was just on this call, yeah. uh, cursing everybody out relentlessly could, could claim they're running and then be given access to the list. So there has to actually be a, 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 a legitimate and specific process well, I'll, laid I'll, out. Here's a question. Is that right? Here's a question. Kind of. I, I, right now I can go to the SEC and I can buy the list of people who voted in the last primaries. I can sure. purchase it. And, and because I give them money, they'll give it to me. Right. So I think if they're a, a, a dues paying member that they should have access to that information. So I, I don't. Member or yeah. a delegate maybe? If, 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 a, yeah. Maybe dues paying member. 
Okay. And delegate. Very good. I agree okay. with that. Maybe because yeah, can... they're, they're a part of the convention body. That's very good. That's And then that would be the way to write it in order to keep um, like we said, we, we want to keep Democrats out sleepers like Crystal Matthews is so eloquently put it. We want to keep them out <laughs> of this process so that they can't undermine it. So, yeah, I think that I think you're I think that's a really good, good point. A person who's a delegate has already passed a, a you know, a litmus test with their fellows in a district, one district, one precinct or another. Yeah. Uh, so that might that might be something to present. And then the EC. The executive committee could could vote on that, and that could be the new thing until we close primaries, which I'd like to get your opinion on. How do we do that, man? Because that that's that is what I want. The whoever wins the next chairmanship, I want a legitimate effort to close these primaries. Absolutely, absolutely, yes. absolutely. Um, I know there are some counties like Lee County where if you're a Republican, it's frowned upon because it's like yeah, I think seventy percent black folks there, and so. Uh, but my hope is that we will have such a ground game of loving our community, not just doing politics, where like, for instance, if you're in a neighborhood and there's a, you know, in your 100 house area, you have a barbecue and you invite people, not even a barbecue, hot dogs, hot dogs are cheap, and, or a potluck, whatever. And you invite Democrats, Republicans, Green Party, whatever, you invite everybody and look for your widows and your orphans, make sure they know how you love. And, and for the next year, you're just every now and then calling the widow, checking on her, calling the, uh, the an orphan in the Bible's day was a child who was fatherless, not a child who didn't have both parents. So you're talking about single moms. So you're just calling and checking on, you know, checking on mom. Hey, just call and check on you. Everything good. And if the widow's house is being devoured by her grass, you go cut it. You know, back in the self-governing system that our founders created, if her roof started caving in, they would call forth the militia not to go to war, but to raise her a new roof. Why? Mr. Fix, it's dead. And today, she would have to spend all that money that she saved to fix her roof. And so then what's she going to do when she runs out of money? She's going to have to depend on government, dad, or God, or however you want to look at it. And I don't like that. I think that's why we're in this situation we're in now, because we've kind of departed from being pro public preserving Republicans. So I, I, I hope that we can have a, a culture that, that, that gets back to that, you know? And confrontational politics is not going to help us get back to that. <laughs> uh, so the iPhone, there's there's no name here, um, but they have their hand raised. Yes. And, and they uh, have a question. Go ahead and unmute yourself or uh, the person who's, whose tag is iPhone and uh, ask your question. And if you, if you feel comfortable, go ahead and tell us uh, who you are. iPhone. Uh, there's another question in the chat that um, I would like uh, I would like to ask. This is Debbie Jones from Charleston, and hey, this Debbie. question, yeah, she's a good person. I know Debbie. Uh, she says someone on the my SEGOP Zoom call today said that they were encouraging folks to contact Zoe by his Telegram account and urge him to drop out of the race. Can you address that? Sure. I mean, obviously, they're not taking Jeff Davis's cues because Jeff told me it's better to have more people running. I'm glad you ran, is what he told me. Oh, yeah, you well, great. You don't think that was lip service? Maybe. I don't know. I don't want to judge mm -hmm. his heart. I can just tell you what he said. You know, I, I, if he tells me he's going to do something – and doesn't, I, I know then. But if he it tells me something, I, I, I believe him until he proves that I don't. You know, and uh, to be honest with you, that's a really great question. It's hard for me to believe. And I don't really trust Jeff Davis at this point because of some things that took place. So that's one of the reasons why I'm also running because I cannot tell people to, to trust him. I just can't. Because if what happens to me happens to you and I told you to trust him, you'd be like, so why the heck did you tell me to trust him? So I can't. Um, but, you know, I, there are a lot of folks who don't understand how the process works, how a brokered convention works, right? I mean, there's questions of how we're going to vote and what it's going to look like. And so the way that I understand it, um, on our team is a former senator named Lee Bright. He's a fundraiser. He's going to be raising funds for us. And Colonel Bill Connor, who ran for the SCGOP against Stephen Brown and um, Chad Conley. I think it was 2011 or something. It was back in the day. <laughs> but anyway... Um, at talking to our senior counsel, we understand that it's generally a brokered convention, meaning that 
if somebody doesn't get 50% plus one, nobody gets eliminated. You can, and they'll, re, they'll re-vote again. So the only thing that happens with somebody like me who's running, who is not trying to have solely confrontational oh, politics where we label lynch people and name them something, and that means they have to be excluded. There are people that, are, that would have voted for Drew because they're not going to vote for Jeff that are going to vote for me because we have an opportunity to govern in South Carolina and have conversations, have meetings like this where there are people from every stream that they would be excluded in the other two companies where we can actually have that conversation, come to agreement, work together, get elected, elected, make sure our communities are alive again. And so, I mean, I'm saying all that to say that it's not that no, anybody's splitting the vote. What's happening is we're going to be able to take enough from Drew McKissick to be competitive because I, frankly, Jeff does not have the delegate votes on his own personality to win. I mean, he doesn't. And he, he told me that he was willing to lose. They were willing to take the chance and lose than take a chance on my leadership because of some misinformation that came out of Lexington about me and because of uh, an opinion about me in York County. Just those two opinions really um, caused them to do something that was really not good. Uh, and it was contrary to egalitarian. So anyway, with that said, I was rolled. I was treated badly. I was abused. I think I might've even been used. My wife tells me you were used so stop working with them. I'm like, I can't. If I can't say unify, I'm not willing to do that to some degree. And so even like here in this last week, they were trying to clamor at me about a temporary president. And I'm like, well, if you got 492 delegates, you could put Mickey Mouse up and get him yeah. elected. <laughs> right? <laughs> you don't need me. <laughs> but I think it's just symptomatic that they don't really have 492 delegates. And so they needed me to help get this, whoever it is we'll have for temporary president. I was going to suggest, I was going to suggest Adam Morgan. I thought that would make Jeff's head explode. Oh, but I, think I think that that would but, be great. I think people <laughs> but, would love that. The, uh, but, free, the head of the Freedom Caucus. But Adam, I, mean, I don't think he's, I don't think he wants to do it. It's but, it's an explosive, contentious it's not really debate. Up to him, though, is it? <laughs> not right. People cannot nominate him. He's going to do what you know his constituents tell him. Yeah. To, to that end, <laughs> let me ask you this because I think that this is a really important point um, with what you've experienced over the past couple of weeks. Um, Looking back, looking back on events and situations as they have unfolded in the past, uh, do you see any examples, and you don't have to be specific, just generally, um, that that mirror the experience of what has been done to you uh, being done to others? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You, That's why I say do. it's a spirit. It's a spirit, man. I'm telling you, I mean, you don't have to believe in God to believe in spirits, right? I believe in God. I believe in Jesus. He said, cast out devils. I'm not trying to participate with devils. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I, I know one when I've seen one, I know one when I experienced one, I try to walk next to people that even have them and I, I'm loving people so that maybe Holy Spirit can help deliver them, show them you don't have to do use the tools of the devil because you're never going to cast out devils if you're using the dual tools of the devil. Right. Mm -hmm. And so yeah, it was a spirit. And it's, it's it, what it does is it ha you have to hate who they hate. Otherwise, you're suspect. Right. Okay. Because listen, they will weaponize. Drew McKissick is not alone in this. People will weaponize the government against you. They'll weaponize the GOP against you. Whatever One power of the structure they have. Control. Whatever power structure. Yeah. What happened with me was I got, became anathema in the company of some folks in my county because I would not violate a man's civil rights in a steering committee meeting. This guy had dumped into somebody's face and the, and that person smacked him. Right. And so the guy who jumped in the guy's face when he got a restraining order, put on the other guy. So the guy now has a restraining order on him and he can't come to county party meetings for almost two years Yeah, and they're tired. They really want him to be able to participate. Right. And so they, they want in the steering committee meeting, they, I mean, there's a whole story to this. I'm not going to go into all of it because it's, it's long and stupid. But at that steering committee meeting, which I did not want to chair because they we were supposed to have it at six. The chair says, hey, I need to move it back to seven. And they said, nope, that's unreasonable. You've changed it three times. We're not changing it again. We're going to have the meeting with or without you. So we need you to chair it. I'm like, why are you, why are you putting me forward, man? <laughs> why are you doing it? I don't think this is right. And so I had to do it. I got on there. I protested. But in that meeting, they wanted to vote to violate this man's civil rights in retaliation for the, for the restraining order. That he had put on this other guy. So and basically, I said, I'm not doing that. Basically, what you're telling me is that that 
you are placed in a position to violate constitutional liberties of an individual uh, by people that you had worked with, trusted, and yeah. you chose the principle of the situation over the personalities involved, and you've been punished for that? Well, absolutely. Um, uh, wow. Well, the key, the key is that some people like to go around the rules. They don't think necessarily that the rule of law is efficient because it's not fast enough. Mm. And they only if apply have, to their enemies, correct? Right. And so it, if it's done to them, it's an outrage. But I'll do it to you because I'm a psychopath. <laughs> I, I don't really care how you feel because what I need to get done is going to get done. And if you're in the way, then we'll just get rid of you. Yeah. Well, so, you know, um, I'm, on, you know, my my view and my goal is righteous and therefore it justifies anything. Sounds a lot like <laughs> Stalin. Anyway, Michelle. No, 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 no. Has... Better yet. Better yet. <laughs> Puritan, Puritan Quaker <clears throat> paradox. Puritan Quaker, not just Stalin. You can't prove you're not oh, a witch. You're right. You're right. They drown That's you right. because you cannot do enough yeah. to prove you're not a witch. That's right. You're right. I want to I want to get Michelle. She's been she's had her hand raised. Michelle Luff. Um, is that her hand raised for a minute? So, Michelle, go ahead, unmute yourself. Michelle, great person for those of you here who don't know. She has done so much on certificate of need, medical rights, parental rights. Uh, parental rights, South Carolina, I think, is her group. And, uh, geez, man, just Champion. so much good work. Champion. Great, great work. Hey, Michelle. This was um, really, um, actually, thank you very much, Corey. I'm so happy to see you here. I'm um, doing this really. Um, thank you. My question is, um, if you win, um, how do you feel about, you know, one of my frustrations during um, paying attention to the legislative session is the, the constant, um, we want through the compromise that frustrates me. Um, you know, I mean, I am a new believer and as I'm, and I don't, you know, I apologize, but I, I love to always bring this up because it's relevant in my life now. Ben. I see the black and white in the Bible. That's what I see. And so my, my view of, of things are black and white. And when I see the compromise, um, it really doesn't sit well with me as well as I am fully aware that the left will utilize that compromise and hijack it and use it and against us. So what are your thoughts on that? Um, and in relation to um, candidates that will be, will step up to run, um, you know, that's a lot of work on them. However, um, you know, are we going to support those, those individuals who are willing to give in to the compromise? Thank you for um, answering my question. Yeah. Thank you for the question. Um, you know, it's difficult because we get the government that we want, you know, it's, we have, it's the system is designed to get direct representation, right. And government goes to those who show up. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, the, the state party, um, oftentimes can seen as the savior, but I think they should be the field service support group mm -hmm. in a, in a theater where there's war. Um, it's the job of the state party or the Mar Div, Marine Division, FSSG, Headquarters Battalion, to send out communications in a way that everybody understands what's happening. Okay, and they have to be pure communications, not like, like Curry was saying, propaganda, so that people really truly understand what's happened. And then they need to be able to supply the troops that are in the theaters where there's contention, where there's battle, and they, they send them the necessary supplies they need. So if a county party is responsive, then the state party can su supply the county party with the tools or the team needed to go help build a district so that you have um, people in that district that will hold that elected accountable to our platform. We really, the state party could yell all day and turn into just a megaphone and, and constantly yell, but it won't change it. It won't change it. What changes it is the lobby. The reason why they compromise is because the lobby in Colombia is stronger than the lobby in their community. That lobby in, in Colombia threatens them and it's their very survival. And sometimes it just makes it really attractive for them. Like th those, that lobby is very attractive. This is what they provide our electeds. Policy, so you don't have to write policy. Insurance, just in case you get sued. They train them, giving them governance training, show you how association services work, how you're supposed to do your job. Or like not, not how you're supposed to do your job, really a really bad way to do your job. What you can get away <laughs> with. What oh, you yeah. can get away with. So <laughs> policy, insurance, funding, training, 
and advocacy. So the funding and the advocacy part, they'll they'll fund you if you if you let yourself be groomed, and they'll provide lobbying. So you know you you get what you what you want from DC. So that's a very attractive, tempting thing. And if we don't have some kind of ground game in there, right now there are people that are gathering up and they're lit dropping what you would consider moderate Republicans who have stood against our values and drop stuff in the hopper that's just garbage. We didn't ask for it. It came from some agency. They dropped it in the hopper. Lit dropping his people, her people. You know what it does? It changes their behavior. <laughs> You're like, oh, everybody's seeing us now. We better do something different. Even right now, the convention's coming, right? Our whole uh, state's on fire. Our county parties are getting overturned. They're like, McMaster's like, well, we better get back in session. Y'all better pass some conservative legislation. <laughs> because we're going into convention and they better have done something. Otherwise they're going to get undone. Exactly. So, I say, but that's I, the power of the whip. So, I'm gonna Michelle, go you. ahead and make your comment. And then after that, I'm going to have iPhone, uh, the iPhone user ask their question just so we don't, you know, so this doesn't get, get too long, but go ahead, Michelle. Uh, what was your comment? Well, I was going to say this a fantastic answer. So thank you. Well, there you go. <laughs> that's what I'm saying. Thank you. <laughs> Great. <laughs> so, the user that's named iPhone with your hand up, you've had your hand raised. Uh, we're going to go ahead and give you another uh, another opportunity to ask your question. iPhone? Oh, that's, <laughs> there you are. There you are. That's you. That's you who just laughed. The person who just laughed. <laughs> oh, man. It's okay. okay. Hey, you know, we, I have a, has um, another question. And, and then... I want to let you guys know, too, at eight o'clock, I have a team meeting. So what I'm okay. going to do is I'm going to send a message to the team and ask if we can push it back to 830. Because uh, if you guys are going to, if you're willing to stick around, maybe we'll go to 830. Is that good for you guys? Are we nodding yeses or no? I think that's great because that, okay. um, I think that people, you know, that this has been such a mess. And I think that people really want uh, to know who Zoe is because there was an opportunity for them to all get to know you. And I think that that, uh, that opportunity was preempted by people who are no longer uh, giving you that opportunity. So we'll go ahead and ask uh, Tanya from Sumter. I'm going to go ahead and ask you to unmute and ask your question. Okay. Because you have your hand raised. Tanya. Hi there. Hey, how are you? Hey, I'm great. Glad to hear you on this call, Corey. I've been following you for a while, so um, oh, thank you. good to hear from you. So, um, so I am so thrilled that you are running. Um, I have a question um, about the the precincts. Um, so, you have the plan to have folks um, engage their neighbors and friends in the precincts. What is your thoughts about um, holding? leaders elected leaders accountable through that same process yeah those precincts inviting those elected officials to precinct meetings i mean that is the face-to-face -face, cannot avoid it conversation i love it that's you're, you're singing our song tanya that's it <laughs> that, what, we, what we're going to do is once we have you know it doesn't have to be 15 20 people in the precinct it could be five OK, call a meeting and in your district, let your entire district know as every precinct in the district that you're having this meeting with this elected's coming and challenge them on their voting, challenge them on their behavior. And if they don't answer you sufficiently, then work with those precincts to censure them in your precincts. Why? Because you want direct representation and he's not representing. You. If your county party doesn't accept that, that censure, doesn't matter. You know why? Your district is the most important jurisdiction. Your county party doesn't elect your elected. Your district does. So whatever district you're working on this particular person, make sure you get it built in those precincts and get those precincts to come to your meeting. And then gotcha. if they con continually thumb their nose at you and say, you don't know how government works. Uh, we can't get the government car in gear because, you know, the thing ain't working. And uh, you should ex essentially you should not accept bad answers. The only answer is I need your help. And if they don't say that, then forget about it. You need to find, probably replace them or at least put more pressure on them so that they change their behavior. If we can change our elected behavior, then we don't have to change our elected, right? It's a lot mm -hmm. easier to change the elected's behavior uh, than to change the elected. It takes a lot more work to change the elected. So 
Well, I also see, in addition to that, briefly, that fundraising can go with the precinct to say, okay, we're going to have a couple of elected here, a couple of elected people here. And if you are able to raise, you know, $2,000 or $1,000 and say, we'd like to make a, a, a donation to um, the 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 person who attends or the person who's most able to represent us, given these are our top three priorities. And we can make a donation to your campaign if we see right. progress in these three areas. To we'll the, see why not. To the, you know, I, I, I think, a, I think is a county party to allowed to do that? Well, the I'm county saying precinct, precinct, the precinct at the well, precinct yeah. level. The county as, party at the precinct level. level. Okay, as a that's that's a really good question. I I think that like as as a representative of a county party, are they allowed to get involved in those primaries? Absolutely, um, they they no, are. The, yeah, the chairs are not. The and they're not allowed the county yeah. party as an entity, right? That's right. That's right. And, okay. and, and also um, like if you're elected as an officer at, you know, county level or whatever, then in a primary, uh, the chairman cannot involve himself in a contested election, at least in uh, Lexington, it's written into our, our, our rules. No, and, and we yeah, can, it's, it's in the state rules, I've, but I've dealt the with delegates, so the delegates are a different matter altogether. Okay. And that's why the delegation, the precinct delegation is so important. Those delegates after convention, what do they do? They're not elected like, you know, presidents, ECs. The precinct delegation is the power of our community. We stopped caucusing. And because we stopped caucusing, we lost connection, con connected control of our electeds. We need to have our precinct delegations filled up because those will be the ones who create that committee that puts that money together, helps get that new elected elected. You know, if, if you have somebody who is living like hell, you know, drag queen story hour at the, at the church <laughs> and whatever you, whatever the, the value that's you, we don't like, you name it, doesn't matter. Um, killing babies in the womb. Um, in Charleston. <laughs> yeah. Then <laughs> we're not going to say names. Sorry. Okay. I'm bad. But sin is sin. <laughs> uh, so <laughs> uh, I want to get to uh, I want to go ahead and get to Jeanette's just so we make sure we Thank have you. this time. Um, I'm going to go ahead and ask Jeanette from Horry County to unmute herself. And I have um, I have one thing to share real quick before you get before you go. Jeanette, absolutely. Check this out. I just got a message. That RJ May is willing to be our temporary president. Well, there we go. The convention. Oh, good. So I'm going to send that message on. to the other camp. I'm going to post that right now uh, as well on all of my platforms. Uh, Corey Allen, the Overton Report, shameless plug um, as we speak. That's great. I think that anybody who speaks out against that move uh, would be showing their true colors because that's a, a great idea. Yeah, I think so too. Um, okay, so I'm sorry, Jeanette. I, I apologize. No problem. Listen, I'm super patient when it comes to you. I can listen to you tell us what we're going to do moving forward all day. Um, I'm real excited about you, man. I, listen, I mean, what you've done and the, the hard decisions that you've had to make over the last 10 days or so, my hat's off to you. Um, but to me, it shows what we need, which is a leader that really cares about what the people want and aren't just rolling out with a small group of people who are making the decisions, but that's not my question. I just want to thank you for that. Mm -hmm. um, so just kind of leading off from um, the announcement about RJ. So do we have, or do you have somebody in place to do the nomination on the floor tomorrow? And are you prepared with um, people uh, to go directly on staff and let's get to work right away and, and one last part of that is what does uh, last night I listened to you with um, Shannon Grady and a great question. And if anybody on this call wasn't on last night's call, tell us what your first hundred days look like after you've got all your people in place. What's what's your plan of action? OK. All right. So I think I, I'm I. I should have written down your first question. So I'll do the first hundred days first. And you kind of remind me of your first question if you don't mind. <laughs> well, um, uh, just real quick is, do you have your staff in place and ready to go? And do you have somebody to nominate you on the floor? Okay. Yes, I, I have my staff in place already. 
Um, and if you don't mind, if any of you who have the image, if you would drop it in the chat, because I'm sure they're chatting uh, again, and maybe even drop it to Jeanette directly, I'd appreciate that. Yes, we have our, our staff already in place, and, and it's on our, on our plan. We have a vision, purpose, mission plan um, outlined for everyone to be able to see the top level view. And then we, the, there's a lot more. We couldn't put it on this paper. We didn't want to spend, you know, $2,000 in flyers. It didn't seem wise. So we made it a one page thing uh, and it's still, you know, front and back. Uh, but anyway, um, yes, we have our staff in place. The first hundred days, I have a young man. He worked for the RNC. He was a staffer for Mark uh, Meadows. And his job was state party digital strategy. Okay. So we need a digital strategy, number one, because a million and a half people voted for Donald Trump in 2020. And 1,500 people donated to the SCGOP last year. I've said that again, right? Because that's an important thing. That means we're not doing a very decent job of messaging, outreach, and, and collecting people into helping us to fund our activities. And they don't trust us. So we have to build that trust back. So we're going to deploy an immediate, we're here. It's a brand new day campaign, okay? The new guards of your rights. We're not going to allow your rights to be trampled. We're not going to stand by and just, you know, wring our hands when, your rights are being violated, like, yeah, like happened during COVID, like happened during the elections of 2020, you know? So uh, basically, we need to put out into the public that it's, it's, a, new, it's a, new, new, a new day. There's a fire and a bonfire, and everybody's invited. And it's the GOP. And it's not the GOP that, that you've seen in the past that's just about, you know, uh, satisfying the money, money and interest Rockefeller or Romney or or whatever type of republicanism. And there's nothing wrong with those people, but they have a certain philosophy of how they do business. And it does not necessarily include we the people. I don't even like to use the term grassroots, okay? They don't like the tree of liberty. <laughs> they, they wanna cut the branches of the tree of liberty. I wanna grow the tree of liberty. I wanna set brush fires in the minds of men, brush fires of liberty, you know, because where liberty is, where the spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. I believe we invent, we create, we uh, just, we are the people who are going to actually build the world because of liberty. I mean, that's, that's what does it. It doesn't happen under these constrained socialist progressive movements. It doesn't happen. There's no creativity there. You know, there's no uh, mm -hmm. just uh, innovation there. So anyway, uh, for the first hundred days, that, that's our first and most important thing is fundraising and marketing and letting people know that the, the GOP is new hitting all those people, letting them know that we agree. Election shenanigans, elections were stolen from Trump because elections were changed at the last minute in multiple states. Constitutions were violated. We agree with you. We need help. We're a new group. We're not the group that would just let people die on the battlefield. We're the group that's going to go back and recover them. And so if you just trust us, give us $5 a month. I mean, if we can tap 300, there's 300,000 people, 360,000 people voted in the primary in 2022 for uh the governor for the statewide race. So that means that 300 something thousand people are participating in our primaries. We could at least get a hundred thousand of those in a year to mm -hmm. donate $5 a month. I mean, that's, that seems like a no brainer to me. We just have to have a concerted effort to get that claim the people, get them into our system so that we can also through that vehicle, get them working in their precincts. Hey, there's an opportunity here. We need you to, to get elected as a delegate. Why? Because delegates have power. And you'll be able to get the kind of policies passed you want passed. We, we're going to build an education arm too. So it's going to start early. We got to let people know how to do their jobs. So we're going to immediately begin with what you would consider a propaganda campaign, but it's really an education campaign. I mean, what does a precinct president do? You know, people don't even know. I mean, what, what <laughs> you know, how, how do you even navigate the state house website? People don't know. How can I find my map for my precinct? People don't know. These are things that we need to be able to make sure our activists are trained on so they can be effective. So that's in our first 100 days is building that infrastructure for the next two years. So I think Tanya had a question. Uh, her hand was raised. Tanya from Sumter. Did, uh, did you want to, did you still want to ask that question? Going once, Tanya? I think, I think she might have asked. Maybe she didn't put her hand down. No, yeah, I think it was Jeanette that asked hers. Um, Okay. Does anybody, uh, does anybody else have a question? If you do now is the time, because uh, I don't know if you've ever been to a convention, but if you haven't, they're uh, quite hectic. And I don't think you, Hey, Rebecca, Rebecca from 
uh, Dorchester, right? That's right. Go ahead and uh, and ask your question. So I, I was talking to some folks today, um, trying to share information on Yuzo, and one of the um, um, I'm trying to figure out how to word this. One of their concerns. Uh, was that, you know, they were told that we need a general, we need Jeff, because Jeff is obnoxious, and he can get in people's face, and we need to stop being so nice. And, um, you know, I, I was sharing some things on that. But in your words, what would you say? Um, what leadership? And I, I mean, I, I obviously gave them my opinion of what leadership does and doesn't look like to run a, a statewide organization. <laughs> but um, in your words, what would you say uh, as a response to that question? Uh, it, regarding, you know, you have to be brash and in your face and rude and et cetera, et cetera, to be a strong leader. Yeah. Well, first of all, I would say that I don't bear the sword for no reason. But I think being a benevolent king is a good thing. And I'm not trying to say that I want to lord over anybody and be anybody's king. But that's how I live in my household. At the end of the day, my kids obey me. <laughs> Not because I'm mean to them and I yell at them and I run around calling them names and label lynching them. I mean, whoever is the chair of the party, you know, they're going to essentially set the tone for the party. You know, it, it, you can see it already. The chair of my SCGOP pretty much sets the tone for my SCGOP. And obviously, they've done a great job in the education of our, of our activists. But... I mean, to a large degree, our meetings have been just fight fest. And then anybody who's not exactly pure is excreted and they're treated like hell. I don't know how we win elections if the people who are, have white hair, that have been doing this for the last 10 or 15 years, who know how to make phone dials and knock on doors are all called rhinos because they don't want to hate somebody they went to jail with 15 years ago fighting <laughs> abortion. You know, it doesn't make any sense to me how we can actually win elections if we're going to treat people in a way we wouldn't want to be treated. And so I think that's the measure is, are you going to treat people the way that you'd want to be treated? If not, then you need to kind of rethink it. If you're okay with people sliming you and calling you names and saying things that aren't true about you behind your back, then have it. Yeah. But I don't think that's what a chair should be doing. I mean, that's, uh, uh, Drew McKissick does it. Jeff Davis does it. It's confrontational politics. It's bot. It's you know, everybody else's fault. I mean, Drew McKissick photoshopped a document with my information on it and Joe Cunningham's name on it to be able to interdict Greenville County and take over their reorgan convention. Hmm. Yeah. He did. Who, who does that? Okay. He, he worked with an auxiliary group in Horry County to overturn the duly elected Horry County uh, officers. He worked with an auxiliary group, gave them the contact information, but wouldn't give it to the GOP that was elected. Wouldn't even talk to them, never recognize them as an elected body. Yeah, he did. So at the end of the day, he did the same thing in Oconee. We have people who take on that exact same spirit in counties in Berkeley. You name it. They'll, they'll, they'll take that because the, whoever's in charge sets the tone for the entire culture of the club. And so we need, I mean, it's, it's safe to say we need a general. Absolutely. But if a general mm -hmm. doesn't understand that we need field service support group. We need communications. We need um, uh, artillery. You know, <laughs> we need motor T we, and we have to have people that can do those jobs. Otherwise it's just going to be us four and no more. Then we got a problem. Uh, and, and, and so in, our, in a community where we're supposed to be, most of us are believers. Shouldn't we obey the King? Yes. Our King. I mean, that first and foremost, our King said, treat people the way you want to be treated. Do what, others should, what you'd want done to you. Amen. If the policy doesn't do that, if your behavior doesn't do that, there's no because I'm in politics, it doesn't work here, that mm. you can disobey the mm. chief, the king himself, who gave the decree that we're supposed to live by, even in politics. Mm. I think, Amen. matter of fact, there's more power there. Because what happens is when people mistreat people who love people, you get meetings like this, where people are like, how in the world did this person who doesn't do wrong things to people, what happened? It doesn't make any sense. Yeah. Everything they're saying is contrary to what we know about this person. And so uh, in the Bible, you know, if the devil would have, would have known what would happen after touching Jesus, he wouldn't have touched Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> nice. um, okay. So I'm going to, I'm going to have Elisa McCam uh, go ahead and, and ask her question. 
And um, yeah, and we st- we still have time. So if there's other people out there who are listening to this and who have questions of their own, go ahead and hit that hand up button and we'll get to yours. Uh, and then I have uh, two questions that I would like to ask you be- before we leave. Um, but after all of that's done. So uh, Alisa, go ahead. Alisa. Um, hey, okay. um, thank you. Thanks for doing this again, Zoe. We appreciate you. But um, I have a question regarding some of the people that are already established. Um, they've been appointed by, you know, Jim McKissick, and I don't know how long some of them have been up there, but probably a little bit too long. Um, you know, I, I've heard that some are appointed by, you know, some of Lindsey Graham's people or appointees and some people that are up there, their staffers or whatever. I'm not sure how the dynamics of personnel and works up there. But is there a way to, um, I mean, do you have to fire everybody? I've heard that discussed on some of uh, the other calls with Jeff Davis that, you know, just gut the whole place from the fire everybody from the ground up and start over or is that necessary or do you have a plan for how to make sure that the people that are around you don't uh are are there for the right reasons that they're um you know i don't even say america first that they're you know going to be constitutional and and be there for the people is there a system in place or do you have an idea about that yeah you know one of the things that's difficult is if they're appointed by the chair, I can absolutely, you know, have a say in their staying in. But if they're appointed by the executive committee um, through advice and consent, then that's a matter. That's a different matter. If they're if they're employees and they were chosen by the chair, then I can get rid of them immediately. Um, so there is a um, it'll, it'll a case by case basis. Some people you can get rid of. Some people it's going to require the executive committee to help. Um, and I, and I'll talk to um, some of my parliamentarians too about what can be done to change the makeup of some committees, because some of those committees too were organized in such a way to prevent you know the people from actually being able to participate. So well, I, I don't necessarily have the full answer on that, but I will get back to you on the things that I don't know how to explain right now. Okay, thank. You. No. We can't hear you, Corey. I'm a, I, I, sorry about that. I'm just going to scroll through these uh, the, the chat real quick just to see if see what 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 kind of questions we can come up with. Hey, uh, so while I'm doing that, why don't you go ahead and and uh, tell us who the people are on your slate? Uh, Tracy from oh, Richland yeah. County. She went ahead and posted uh, what you asked to be posted there. So go ahead and, and and tell us a little bit about, you know, maybe the person that, that you want for vice chair, why you want them there, you know, you know uh, things like that. Why don't you tell us yeah. why you've picked your team? Okay. Well, my first vice chair is Autumn Dunlap and um, I trust her. I've trust, I, I just, I trust her. She loves the Lord. Her family are ministers and she is a chapter chair uh, of, of Moms for Liberty uh, so it was in the uh, Republican women, the uh, steeplechase Republican women and the, the fe- Federation. Uh, Krishana, can you tell me what the Federated Women's Club is called again? Oh, hey, Zo. Hey. Good evening, everybody. It's the steeplechase Republican Women's Club. Yes. The Thank Federal- you. Okay. <laughs> yeah. And so Krishanda, it's good to see you. Dang, I didn't even notice you. Down there. Good I Sorry, I was late. My face was in Greek. I'm in class right now. <laughs> So she's from Kershaw County. Um, she's a, a, an administrator. She's a, a Adobe certified. Um, I, I would like to have a teammate at first vice chair that's not just there just to take over meetings when I'm not there or vote on things, but somebody who can actually even communicate what we're doing, what's coming up next. It's another thing. We were, we were talking about that last night, I think, on Shannon's call. Is like, what, what are the first, second, third vice chairs? What do they do? A lot of times people don't know. But I, I want our chairs to have an active role so that people have an identity to aspire to, a hope for the calling, you know, even in the GOP. Like uh, if the first vice chair, I, I mean, we're going to be really busy, but the first vice chair is going to be able to tell us there's meetings coming. We're going to be having a, an event over here. There's something going on down here. The government master is going to be down here and they can actually voice that. We'll record videos. We'll have them communicating those things. Uh, the second vice chair, uh, my hope 
for the second vice chair is to have a, a media liaison that, that is able to not only uh, talk with our legislative delegations where, where policies are, but report on what's really happening there and, and even talk with the media and make sure that we're being represented fairly. You know, we can we'll have discussions about what's coming. You know, when he has to talk to somebody, we'll make sure our messaging's right. And then he'll run with it. Why not? You know, in the third vice chair outreach, someone who is able and that's Tanya Eden. So Ton, Tony Spain is the second vice chair. Sorry, buddy. Richland County. Tony Spain is amazing. Special forces guy. Uh, military. T tell, tell us a little bit about your pedigree, Tony, please. Oh, Tony. Hey, man. OK, cool. So Tony will be what, what's the position, Tony, you're running for? Uh. I'm running for second vice chair. Okay, and, cool, man. Yeah, talk to us. Yeah, so um, and it's, it's not special forces. It was uh, 82nd Airborne, Paratrooper. Airborne. Airborne. Special Airborne. operations, Sorry. not Sorry. special forces. Oh, they, oh. they wear the green beret. I wear the maroon one. So nice. I, I didn't want to get anyone confused with that because that's a big deal. But um, so media liaison, uh, I basically did it in the in the Army for, for 10 years because it's basically public affairs, right? Um so I have experience on how to, how to work with the media and tell that story of what the legislature is doing uh, and work out that back and forth. And, and that's pretty it's important because lack of information leads to a lot of bad things. Because mm -hmm. when you don't have good information, people fill their holes with, it, with, with what they believe or what they want. Mm -hmm. They think the information is. And then I, you end up with, feelings of resentment and the back and forth. And I feel like so maybe that's why we have some of the factions in the party right now, because the leadership that we currently have is not sharing the information that they need to be sharing. Very good. Um, so nice. I think the more information that we can get out there and put out there, it'll, it will bring unity to the party or it should bring unity to the party and stop some of the inner fighting. Excellent. To that, to that, to that effect, um, I want to ask a question because this is one that people have brought to me. Um, at the end of the day, the SCGOP chairman race is always, or in the recent, in the recent past, has been extremely uh, controversial. I guess mm -hmm. might be one way to describe it. Uh, contentious, I think, mm. would probably be a more accurate way to describe it. Divided. Uh, so uh, divided, absolutely, is is uh, a <laughs> very, very adequate way to describe it as well. So when it comes down to it, okay, we're, we're all in that room, locked in from 11 a.m. till whenever. Uh, the votes are coming in. The the uh, just from my own experience, the uh, with the locked doors, the threats are coming down, the uh, implied threats, the uh, attempts at at uh, I don't know, you better <laughs> you better vote the way I want you to vote or else starts coming down um, when when that happens and, and it's going to happen. I don't know how many people in here have not not been to a convention before, but it's going to happen. Um, I'm not I, I, I'm not even a voter, and it comes at me. You know, I mean, geez, please. Um, when that happens, at the end of the day, uh, let's say, because we all know it's a fifty percent plus one. Let's say it's Zoe with. I don't know, just, and, and I'm just throwing these numbers out there, 38, um, McKissick, 38, and then I'm not very good at math. I'm an English individual. Uh, you, I was told there'd be no the, math. And then the, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I don't have my calculator. Uh, with, uh, uh, 76. Accounting, accounting for inflation, we're going to, okay. So, so, and then, uh, and then Davis gets the remainder. Okay. Um, you have a majority over Davis. Davis is third place. Do you believe that Davis would back down? And if not, what is the, what's, what's the, what's the next step? Well, you know, honestly, I believe that it's, I think he would. Uh, yes, I think he would. And I think he would because 
I think his judgment um, is that it would make him look bad if he didn't. Mm. Because really, he said he wasn't in it to try to, you know, he was pushed forward to do it. And they were concerned about X, Y, and Z. But I, I, I think he would. I think he's, because it's not, it won't, it, it'll make him not look good. You know, and, I, and um, even vain and unreasonable people understand if you don't look good, then you don't look good. <laughs> and so I'm not saying he's vain and unreasonable necessarily as much as that, because that's just the state of nature. I think that's what will happen. Now, sometimes people say, well, if you made over 20%, you stay in. Okay. You know, um, but I mean, I don't know. I don't know that he would. But uh, before we go on, I'd like because I'm running out of time now. I would yeah. love to get Autumn to speak for herself, Tanya to speak for herself. If Tracy's on, um, okay, if yeah. that's okay, Autumn, are you on the call? Hey, I am. Hey, can you just kind of tell us who you are and, and and just say hello to everybody? You don't have to talk long. I'm not trying to get you to put you on the spot, <laughs> but but I but you're on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> Thank so. <laughs> <laughs> um, hey guys, thank you so much for just, first off, just taking the time to come on this evening and hear a little bit more. Um, so a little about me One, I'm just, I'm so excited to have the opportunity to stand beside such a wonderful man of God and support him and be a part of a team that truly wants to work together and be servants for our community. Cause that's what this, these roles are. They're servant roles. Um, they're not positions of power and they never should have been. Um, every bit of what we do to serve one another should be just that an act of service. Um, that's what we're commanded to do. It's what God called us to do is to be his hands and feet. Um, so just very quickly about me. Um, I am a worship leader. That is something that God put in me that I will do until I don't have breath left in my body. Um, so I love the Lord. I love my family. I have an amazing husband and three wonderful children. I've been in youth ministry for going on 15, almost 16 years now. And in my local community, I am our Kershaw County chapter of Moms for Liberty, the chapter chair. I serve as the second vice president for the Steeple Chase Republican Women's Club. Uh, previously, I was a secretary to our Kershaw County GOP. Um, and now I'm very excited to have the opportunity to serve on a larger scale. So hopefully that answered it quickly and concise. <laughs> You're with Infrared Autumn. I am. Awesome. I, I, that's that's a point in your favor. I think that, uh, I, I, I mean, obviously, I think that that, that puts you uh, in, in front runner status. <laughs> Great. Tanya, well, Tanya, you. are you on the call? Tanya Eddins? Oh, she's maybe she may be gone, you know. She said she had to take another call. She was trying to jump okay. back on as fast as she okay. could. Okay. Who else do um, we have? Let's see. Is Tracy? Tracy's on are you on the call? She's gonna work administration for us and, and communications. Tracy, are you on the call? Tracy, what's the last name of Tracy? Oh, she's not on the call. Tracy's not hi, on. Tanya's on. Hey okay. Tanya, can you kind of tell us a little <laughs> bit about yourself and and um, some of the things, just a couple of things you've done in outreach uh, so people can kind of see your abilities. Oh, wonderful. Um, thank you for the opportunity. And I'm like Autumn. I'm just kind of amazed and, and um, honored to be with Zoe and Autumn um, working together to help our state GOP. Um, I agree with both Autumn and Zoe about that this is a servant leader role. Um, my background, I'm from Sumter. I grew up here, um, graduated from Clemson, um, went away to live in the city for a while in Charlotte, came back and had a lot of outreach um, experience with Charlotte World Trade Association. At that time, back in the 90s, um, a lot of people found the value in networking. And so we had 200 people at our meetings every month and about 500 for our Christmas party. And I served as the secretary for about three years and vice president for two years. So um, large numbers don't scare me. I think that's lots of fun. And the more the merrier is kind of my philosophy on that. And I also worked in the South Carolina Calvert Academy, which was a state virtual charter school. And we, for, uh, we formed with some parent volunteers and teachers a, uh, a group to help form, um, find places in the curriculum for the state, the statewide student body to engage in field trips, low cost, no cost tri field trips. And we did it in three regions across the state on the same day simultaneously. 
Um, and we had an orientation that we held at the State Museum, and we finished with a field trip, field day at uh, the Plex, Rain or Shine. So people coming in from all parts of the state, from Hilton Head, Greenville, wherever, and we had a great day. So organizing people and coming together and creating a sense of community is something that I love to do. So, um, and I've been involved in my kids' schools and things like that, and the Republican Party. Most recently I did, I got 156 signatures against the um, bill H4066 to change the state party delegate formula. And then also 176 signatures for the constitutional carry. And we did that completely outside of the party with a group of volunteers of about really a handful, like four or five people with support of some other four people. So getting things done is kind of what I like to do. And I hope to get to do it with y'all and help make our state a better place. Mm. Outstanding. Thank you so much, Tanya. Hey, Zoe, um, can I jump back in for a quick second? And I'm yeah. sorry to cut you off. Sure, sure. <laughs> but, but I did leave out one very important um, piece that I would like to share with everybody. And as I mentioned, I'm one of our local county chapter chairs of Moms for Liberty. Um, and while Moms for Liberty does not, as a whole, endorse candidates outside of school board races, the large majority of our chapter chairs individually are very proud to endorse Zoe for chair. Oh, wow. <laughs> well, thanks. That's, that's really encouraging. Thank you for that. Um, that's modern. interesting because this, the Freedom Caucus, I think it is uh, illustrated uh, a very similar uh, belief. Uh, the, the Freedom Caucus is not allowed to endorse, but the only member the only person running that any member of the Freedom Caucus has endorsed uh, is you, Zoe. I think that's something that's extremely important for people on this call to remember, uh, especially when they compare it to certain other people running for this position, uh, claiming vaguely that they had the full and uh, unwavering support of that caucus, despite you know the evidence at hand. Sorry, I just had to that's put that okay. In there. We have we have one more team member that's on the call. I think Chrissy. She is going to be helping us in our on our election integrity task force. Chrissy, would you like to to um to share? Yes. Um, yes, I'm Chrissy Moore. I'm actually in Fairfield County. And so I've been working with South Carolina Safe Elections for the last couple of years. Um, and um, man, uh, have we learned a lot in the last two years. Mm -hmm. um, I actually got involved with the Republican Party whenever the election was stolen and um, it has been a journey for the past couple of years. And um, so I also have a servant heart and I believe that God has put each and every one of us here to lead and to be bold for Christ and bold for truth. And so um, I am excited to lead and um to take the torch and and you know my biggest thing is truth and transparency mm -hmm. and um a big portion of that is uh, i'm the ec in fairfield county now and we have been educating our delegates and they are excited to get also to you know to carry the torch with election integrity more than more than anything and i think that's echoed across the state and across the nation. So um, I actually, I was a graduate of Furman University and um, was a social worker, ran my own business uh, with durable medical equipment. I was a contract uh, business that um, worked the Medicaid program in South Carolina. And, um, and I, you know, I, I really I've homeschooled all of my children and that has been wonderful. Um, I believe in uh, world changers. And so um, so anyway, I'm just excited to be working with this team. I uh, really, really believe that this is God's will 
and um, I'm excited to watch Zoe lead the state of South Carolina as chairman. I, I'm, I, I have to respond to that because, you know what, I'm excited that the Lord has given me a team. And so I'll be serving you all in all the areas that you're experts in. So it's not just a matter of me leading as much as it's a matter of us fighting this war together. You know, uh, we all have an area that we're experts in that we couldn't do the other person's job. Right. And um, one of what the, my wheelhouse is, is the place where explicit and implicit meet and being able to, to bear the tension to figure that out, because that's where the tremors happen. That's where the earthquake happens. It's like, right. If we can work and I love working in that area with people in relationships and understanding. I love it. And so it, I, it helps me to be fair. I, lo I love judgment. I love the place of discussion and debate and not to be mean and just to win arguments, but to understand, you know? And so I think we actually need a chairman um, who is reasonable and is not unfair. And so the, the question of the hour for this race is oh, if, they, if you're called Maya CGOP, okay. if you're called Maya CGOP, if you're called Q, if you're called you know, extremist, oh, or you're standing before Drew McKissick, you know, would you get a fair hearing in, in that, in that, in that, in that court, if you're under investigation or, or whatever, if you called a establishment, if you called Rhino, if you hung out with Drew, you know, if you, if you, you know, took a picture with the wrong person and you were standing before Jeff Davis, would you get a fair hearing? No. I don't think that anybody is fooled by it's just a matter of who's going to beat the other people enough. And so there's a reason, and this is my last biblical reference. There's a reason why some of the Jews chose Barabbas over Jesus. You know, both Barabbas and Jesus offered the Israelites the same thing, deliverance from their enemies. But one said, let's go kill our enemies. And the other one said, love your enemies. Do good to them who do evil to you you know, despitefully use you and persecute you, pray for them. That doesn't mean you're not going to step up sometime and have to cut off their heads because they violated the right for somebody else. I will not tolerate that. If you've weaponized any government at all, you're going to pay the penalty because that is evil. I don't, you cannot use the power to hurt people. I mean, that's what's happening with the, the FBI. They're, they, they weaponize the FBI against Donald Trump. They're weaponizing government. If we don't stop it in our party, there's no way in, on God's green earth we're going to stop it out there in the government, in the civic realm. we okay. got to stop it right here at home first. And so okay. we can't tolerate that as a group. Guys, we should not tolerate that. If we see that happen, we need to bring that out and discourage it. I'm not talking about they wore the wrong color tie or they talk with a list or they talk too long like I do sometimes. But if they're weaponizing government, if they're violating our platform, thumbing their nose at us, we have to hold people accountable. That's just all there is to it. We don't have to call them names, label lynch them, Amen. but there are tools available for us to make sure there's an evidentiary campaign for their primary opponent and that there's an infrastructure built in to make sure we get our people elected and keep them elected. And that's what we want to bring to the Cyclone GOP. So I just ask you guys, our, our team is ready to serve you. Um, we're ready. We have already got our marching orders. We already have the tools. The guy uh, who's not on the call, Noah Montgomery, if you guys go to Roosevelt.tech, he created that. Roosevelt.tech. It's a service for Christian conservatives to be able to launch campaigns digitally. We're going to teach people how to run campaigns. We're going to teach people how to actually, if you want to run somebody's campaign, we will teach you how to run people's campaigns. That way the elected can just go do their smiling and talking and you can make sure their campaigns managed. We'll teach you how to make a finance plan. We'll teach you how to micro target. We'll teach you all the digital OTT, all the stuff you need to know. Okay. I went to a campaign leadership college and got two books this thick, right? And for 10 days, we were trained on how to run campaigns. Okay, we're going we're gonna to teach our people how to be effective, not just yell and call people names, oh, not wow. use backdoor deals and money to, you know, and, and overturn county parties. We don't need to use the tools of the devil. We don't. We can just create a system that is going to grow activists up to be empowered. And, and I mean, we have to have a self-governing nation. If we're not empowered and educated and encouraged and, and, and let loose, to go self-govern, then what are we even doing? We're just going to grow more government. We can say we won't limit a government all day, but you can't have limited government without a self-governing people. 
So thank you guys for your time tonight. Um, we're probably going to need to run for our team meeting now, but absolutely before, Hey, before you go, just let me, I, I really feel I need to say just one thing. Um, sure. Zoe, first off, thank you for, for talking to the people tonight. That's something that nobody would ever expect from a person that's attempting to run the entire South Carolina GOP. That's uh, uncensored that's that's just something that never happens accessibility also, is one of our tiers accessibility of leadership and the SCGOP is critical which is a point <laughs> and here is another point that i want to make um zo you and i we have had so many conversations over the years and we have there have been points where we have vehemently disagreed um just adamantly and there's never been a point where your reaction was well obviously we need to ostracize you and uh and make your dissenting voice uh invisible and that's something that i think is sorely lacking in today's uh political landscape i thank you for uh the good faith conversations that we have had because uh you know there have been some knockdown drag outs between me and you. <laughs> um, but at the end of the day, we know, we understand that we're having a conversation about uh, f- from a position of good faith and both yeah. wanting what's best. And wow. I think that that's something that you have done consistently that I've seen uh, that I-, I think you're probably one of three people in the state that I could actually honestly say that about that's not an endorsement because i don't do that um, darn but i'm just, I'm just playing <laughs> thank no, you trust though. me Thanks it would for hurt the encouragement. you it would hurt you better than <laughs> more than it would help you <laughs> i promise uh but but no i mean that that really is a thing it's it, people can come to you have a discussion and disagree with you and you don't just decide to dispense of them and have your anybody who uh, backs you uh, ostracize or alienate them and that is something that I have not seen of any other candidate running for this office I, I, that's all I have to say on that uh, matter and I just had to before this this meeting ended I appreciate your encouragement man I'm getting a request right now from somebody that was on the call to give the uh, the picture uh, should I put it in the chat maybe I should put it in the chat um it's in uh, the actually, chat, but is it? we can put okay. it we can put it in there again. Um yeah, please do. If you put it in there one more time, and then I'll also type in if you don't mind. Let me see, I gotta find the chat thing. That was a lot wh- of chats. While you're doing that, I just want to let everybody here know that after this, I'm gonna do a very short, like two minute introduction explaining to people that we started recording this late. Uh and then it will be it will be published on the Overton or on and on my Facebook page and YouTube and everywhere else. So um, I just want to let you guys know in case your your intent was to share it out to other delegates so that they can hear Zoe in his own words. So there it is. I really hope you enjoyed it. I really think uh I really think that this is an important issue, though it's not the most important issue, uh, as I've said on previous podcasts, but leaders matter. The ideas and the ideals of leaders matters. It matters to me. So regardless of how things turn out, it's very important that from that moment, we fight for our principles and fight for something real. It's easy to fight against. It's easy to be anti. A revolution is easy to implement, but building consensus, building a legitimate force for good, building an institution that works for its constituents, for its citizenry, for its people, That, that is what's really important. So you got to ask yourself, 
is the person that you're voting for, if you're a delegate, is their goal to build or is their goal to tear down, hype people up, and implement mob mentality? That's a decision we all have to make for ourselves, but here we are. I'll see you guys tomorrow. You can sign up for the OvertonReport.substack.com. You can follow me on Twitter at, uh, at Overton underscore the and on Facebook, Corey.Allen.Overton, or you can just search Corey Allen. You'll see me. Uh, we're going to be live streaming, live tweeting, uh, and, and talking about the South Carolina Republican Party convention all day tomorrow you don't want to miss a single moment of it i promise you because we're not going to let anybody lie we're not going to let anybody implement power that they don't deserve to have we're going to make sure we're going to be the watchdog for you to make sure that power hungry power seekers are not able to steal the will of the people for their own gain. That I can promise you, just like the Overton Report and myself, just like we have always done, we will do it again at the South Carolina Republican Party Convention tomorrow, Saturday. Bet your life on it. Thank you guys for tuning in and listening to what you just heard. I think it's important for us all to hear it. And, uh, and I really do appreciate your support. We're going to be uh, speaking some very hard truths in the very near future. And that support is going to be much needed because the powers that be will be coming down upon us uh, attempting to rain fire uh, from the depths of hell. <laughs> but that's what we expected and knew would happen from the moment that I created the Overton Report. That's what we're here for. To take the arrows in order to tell you the truth. And that's what we'll always do. We'll see you soon.